Hello and welcome to The Thriller Zone. I'm your host, David Temple. I was chatting with my wife just before I came on to record this and we were talking about how we are living our dreams and so forth. And on today's show, you're going to hear me talk to Joey Hartstone, our special guest, about how he's living my dream. What does that mean? Well, he is a screenplay writer by trade, and he is also debuting his brand new book, a, a legal thriller. So that makes him part of our Discovery New Author series. And uh, I am currently living my dream of having this podcast, but if I could biggie size my order, as they say at one of those fast food restaurants, I would be podcasting, writing novels, and turning those into screenplays. That's just, just as a bit of clarification as you get to know your host, David Temple. So there you have it. And that is uh, just something I like to remind myself of from time to time. But I mean, it, in case it doesn't show, I absolutely love this podcast. I mean, what's not to love? I get to hang out with the most awesome creators, creative minds in the business, thriller writers who are living their passion. And by the way, um, let me use this little time for a side note. You think you've enjoyed year number one? Yes, we're approaching our first year anniversary by the end of this month. Year two, as we kick off year two, you're going to see the thriller genre expand. We've done a lot of military thriller. Uh, this particular episode is a legal thriller. We've got uh, police procedural thrillers. We've got psychological thrillers. We're going to expand a little bit more into even sci-fi thrillers and even romance thrillers. If it thrills, we're doing it here on the Thriller Zone. Kind of makes sense, right? So anyway, stay tuned for that. Now, on today's show, check it out. Joey Hartstone is a screenplay writer in Hollywood right now, and this is his very first novel. And let me tell you something. I know I say this a lot. I don't care. I mean it. I shoot it to you straight. This thing grabs you by the throat and pulls you along for the ride. And we're going to read some of the reviews that are on the back cover. Uh, later in the show, but uh, this is a dandy story. I think you're going to really like it. Oh, and before I forget, stick around to the end of the show because I have a couple of extra announcements to make that I think you're going to really want to hear. And I know that having studied some of the analytics of the show, sometimes people don't stay to the very tail end, but <laughs> not to tease you too much, you're going to want to stay to the very end of the show. So thank you for letting me uh, do that little preamble. And uh, without any further ado, please welcome the soon to be legendary Joey Hartstone right here on the Thriller Zone. Hello. Mm. Hello, handsome. You too. How's life? <laughs> Good. Back Good. at you, babe. Good. <laughs> uh, thanks for having me here. Oh, are you kidding me? Thank you. I mean, my yeah. little tiny little podcast. We're just happy to have you. No, it's fun to be here. First of all, before we go any further, everything sound good? Look good? You happy? Yeah, me. I, I think this microphone works, but I can't figure out how to test it before I get on. So It sounds delicious. It looks like the Great. new Shure uh, podcast mic. That's what it is. So it better be working. <laughs> I know a few things about microphones. I'm, I see know. that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is yours a shore as well this is the the mac daddy shore this is what okay. uh i did 25 years in radio and this was the microphone i used okay. pretty much my whole career gotcha okay yeah. and that's the recording booth uh where i do voiceovers and stuff love it yeah i've actually been wondering what that was i thought that's a really interesting entrance to this room so thank you for telling me that it's been it's been a question of mine yeah, it's. Uh, I would spin the camera around, but it's not all that interesting. It's a. It's a standard uh, audio. But actually, I have the door open, don't I? Yeah. Hold on a second. It's hermetically sealed. Yeah. In case of a uh, nuclear disaster, I go in there with the dog Dex and my wife Tammy, and we're good to go. Multifunctional. I like that. It also doubles as a tanning booth, stand-up tanning um, booth. Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> oh God. 
First of all, welcome to the Thriller Zone, Joey Hartstein. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I was uh, ripping through this book today. It's called The Local. Um, when the this arrived. <laughs> nice. The real one. <laughs> uh, I got to tell you, though. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, a lot of times you'll see a, a mock-up cover. But as you can see, folks, yeah. that's identical. Yeah, they did a really nice job. I am a fan of covers, as my listeners know. And this one, this one's funny because it's super simple, but it pulls you right in. I'm like, oh, what's with the uh, yeah. the old uh, Ford pickup truck? And of course, yeah. three pages in, you know what's going on. Yeah, no, a guy named Michael Windsor designed that. And I had no input other than to say, I love that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, welcome to the Discovery New Author series that we offer uh, every once in a while on the show. And it's super cool. I mean, I'm a little geeked out and I'll try to remain really chill and pull on my former LA vibe so that I don't look like a geek. But just know that I am. Okay. <laughs> when I tell you that to have a screenplay writer and a novel writer in one on the show makes me so freaking happy. Oh, cool. Well, I'm happy to be both. So yeah, you're a double threat. So we're going to get to the local here in just a couple of minutes. But I want to before we get to this debut legal thriller, I want to talk about you a little bit. And uh, while reading about you, I learned that we have a couple things in common. Part of this is serious. Part of it's fun. Uh, you're from a small we're both from small towns. Mm -hmm. Flagstaff, Arizona, you Winston Salem, North Carolina for me. Yep. Um, you have a degree in political science. I break out on a rash whenever politics is mentioned. And we both wanted to be screenplay writers. Of course, the biggest difference being you are one and I still am dreaming of it. It'll happen soon. It should. <laughs> do you, Joey, do you find it's true? I, I lived in LA. I did three tours of duty there back in the uh, early 90s and then late 90s. Do you feel like it's true? Because I noticed you have spent about a decade before you really hit. Do you agree with that theory that it takes about 10 years to make it in Hollywood? Sure feels that way for me. Uh, I'm I'm a TV writer now, so I have the opportunity to work with a lot of writers. And yeah, it, it kind of runs the gamut, but it takes a little bit of time. It certainly takes longer than you want it to believe it's going to take when you get off the plane and you're 25 years old. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me what that was like. And so you went from straight from Flagstaff to LA. You're just like, Hey, I'm packing up and going. No, I went to school just outside of Boston. And when I graduated, I was 23. And then I came straight to LA and I wanted to get my master's at UCLA. So it took me three years just to get into that program, another couple to complete it. And then it was just kind of incremental progress until finally I had a script that got some attention. Wow. Okay. So let's see, let's back up a second. So poli sci was college, right? Was yep. the master's at UCLA in screenwriting? Writing. Yeah. Wow. See, that's another thing. I always dreamt of going to UCLA. That is one of the top schools for that field, is it not? Yeah, and it's a it's a beautiful place. I almost wish I'd gone there for undergrad when I got there, but yeah, yeah it's nice. My wife and I were up there recently, uh, within the last sixty days, and I hadn't been there in about. Oh, almost 10 years and I could not believe the size of UCLA. Yeah. I, I know it's way, I, I did not go to a big university, so it's, it was a different experience. Although as a master's candidate, I just kind of admired what the undergrads were doing, but I, I did not get to partake. So. Yeah. And not just, you know, not just that part of town, West side uh, village and so forth, but I mean, the, the school just seems to keep uh, spreading like kudzu all around and, and gobbling up everything in its path. It's huge, but the, uh, the the school of theater, film, and television is just one small corner in the in the really the upper corner of it. So, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, would you say that that was a pivotal point? Uh, that part of education, pivotal, a um, master's degree. I mean, that's pretty. Yeah, it's yeah. not. I mean, it's certainly not a prerequisite to becoming a professional writer. Uh, it's very helpful when you are an unemployed writer in feeling a little bit better about yourself for a couple of years, <laughs> and, and then you get a, and then you get a great network of people too. So you get to learn from other writers, and you get kind of the impetus to do a lot of writing, but it, it is nice for two years to be able to hold your head up just a little bit higher. 
Just for my listeners who enjoy the podcast and uh, are aspiring writers, can you take me inside what an average day of a screenplay writer in a group of writers as yourself would be like? Yeah, so right now I'm on the second season of a show called Your Honor, which is on Showtime, starring Brian Cranston. Um, so yeah, uh, well, it's all virtual now, so it's a little bit different than it used to be, but we, we sign on to a Zoom room at about 10 o'clock in the morning. We have writers all over the country. We do that for four or five hours. We break stories. We have digital whiteboards and things like that. Uh, it's a group of 10 writers. We have 10 episodes, and every so often a new person leaves the room to go off and write their episode. Wow. Now that is a big shift, isn't it? It is. It is. It, it, it's certainly more fun when we're all in the same room, but there is an efficiency to, uh, to doing it on Zoom. And there's certainly something nice about not having to commute an hour each way. <laughs> yeah. What part of LA do you live in? I'm in Studio City. Oh, that was yeah. the first town I lived in when I moved there. Yeah. Really? Yeah. So you're not far from CBS. No, except that that building just sold. So uh, even though this is a CBS studio show, uh, that building is no longer owned by CBS. So, uh, wow. That's been CBS forever. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Crazy. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm going to detract for just one second. I used to live in a little town, a little street called, uh, Arch Drive. Okay. Right there off of uh, Lancashire and Ventura Boulevard and, oh, wow. uh, yep. the epicenter of it all. Anyway, yeah. um, I want to, uh, I don't want to steal your thunder. Uh, so why don't you share us with uh, my listeners what that thunder looks like? Because w what I want to do is, um, as it pertains to the story itself, um, just kind of synopsis it for me as we get into the local. Sure. Yeah. So the local is about a small East Texas town called Marshall. And about 20 years ago, there was a new federal judge who was appointed and he changed the rules of his courtroom to make it essentially the most efficient place to sue for patent infringement. And so over the course of the next few years, it just became the most popular place to do so. And then there was this cottage industry of local attorneys there who were signing on to these big out of state legal teams to serve as local counsel. And it started as a really small project where they didn't have a lot of responsibility. But as the out of state team started to learn, these locals were essential in communicating with the local juries and swaying them to their side. So there's just this, this sort of stable of really talented trial lawyers in East Texas who probably never envisioned that they were going to be patent attorneys, but they made their living that way. And is it true uh, what you created in Marshall that uh, they uh, delegate uh, and distribute that large of winnings constantly? Yeah, so it's, so it's called the rocket docket because they're able to go through trials so quickly because the rules of that court are, are just made to be efficient. And then one thing that did sort of turn out to be a pattern was that juries here are much more predisposed to, to siding with the plaintiffs and then to awarding bigger uh, cash prizes than, than other venues. So plaintiffs get to choose where to sue, and this became a very enticing place to do that. Man. This was such a good book. It was so solid. And, you know, I'm going to tell my listeners this, and I, I've only, I say it very rarely, but I, I cannot believe this is your first novel. Um, because, it, it, I mean, it's a good book. It's a solid story. It feels real. Um, I love this James Euchre character. I mean, he's so layered. You know, you, you, this is what I love about a writer like yourself, that you, you think you know who someone is, and then you, you peel away a little bit and you go, oh, it's not quite like I thought it was. And, and, and the, even the town of Marshall was a little bit of that, because Marshall is a character, and you yeah. think it's one way, but it, it unfolds a little bit differently. Yeah, I, I like this character a lot. There's, a, there's pieces of me in there. So I did want him to be complex and interesting. And then, yeah, the town, I mean, I got to visit. And there it was a very welcoming place and a very interesting place. But there, there was just this aura of people would speak to you, but they didn't want to say anything. And that, I found that fascinating. There's two things I want to do a quick reverse because um, I remember seeing LBJ and I've always been a big Woody Harrelson fan uh, talking about law and so forth. And I thought that's one of the first times I, I've ever seen Woody truly disappear into a character, um, which is just a side note. But um, and then shock and awe uh, was a, when you got to team up again with I mean, how does a guy like you get to write not one but two stories with that that features both a world-renowned director, Rob Reiner, and a, a superstar actor like Woody Harrelson. 
Yeah, well, that was credit to Rob. Uh, I got very lucky. LBJ was my first project that got produced and it, it got made because three people, uh, Matt George financed it. Rob Reiner said he wanted to direct it and then he got Woody Harrelson to star and that, that made it into a movie. And, and while we were doing that, Rob said, I, you know, I have this idea. I want to tell, tell a story about sort of the mistakes that got us into the Iraq war. And we were filming LBJ in New Orleans and it was a really good time. He runs a really fun set and Woody was having a blast. So Woody asked what we were talking about and Rob just kind of pitched him the idea without even telling him which character he'd play. And Woody said, great, I'm in, I want to do it. And so that, that one came together a lot easier than the first one did. Okay. Uh, Joe, you have a little bit of a, I don't know, fairy dust, sparkly rainbows over your head or something, because you sound like you're, you have fallen into a whole lot of good fortune. Absolutely. It's, it's true. And everybody who came, I was, I mean, writers don't always go to even get invited to set. Sometimes it's in your contract that you get to spend one or two days there. And Rob was really gracious and invited me to be there the whole time and worked with me and incorporated me into the process. And he certainly didn't need my experience to do so. Um, but it, it, it was fantastic. And everyone who came to visit the set would say, it's never going to be like this again. And they've been right. It, it, it was a very special time. You mean, uh, because of COVID, the, that, that sent aspect no. of it? Oh, no, it was just, it was 2015 when we filmed oh, it. And I think, I think yeah. people would come and they just see, you know, Rob, Rob knows what he's doing. He's been doing this a long time. And so it, I mean, people worked really hard, but it, it was fun. There aren't, there weren't people screaming at each other. There were no, you know, it was a, it was, it was a good set and a really fun experience. And I think they knew that that was not always going to be the case in Hollywood. And I've heard tales of uh, Joey that uh, a lot of times once you're, once your uh, project gets picked up and, you know, the writer becomes, yeah, Joey, can you just wait over maybe a across town? Cause, uh, yeah. 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 Oh, and you, and you can get rewritten, especially if it's your first script. Um, you know, it's very, it's very easy for them to say, okay, well, we're putting a lot of this money into it, but we're going to, we're going to hire somebody that we trust to do a little polish here and there. And, and certainly Rob lended his hand to the script, but he, but he let me be a part of it the whole way. And just sitting across a desk from Rob Reiner and getting to, pitch lines was was a dream come true <laughs> Dude. now you let me let me back even further so how long have you been daydreaming about this because you're living you're literally quote air quoting here the dream so how long have you been dreaming about this it took about 10 years so i graduated college in 2005 and up until my last semester there i thought i was i was a politics major as you said and i thought i was going to go to law school and i decided i didn't want to do that and i was very fortunate that my school had their first screenwriting class my last semester there and i took it my professor mark weinberg had gone to ucla and he encouraged me to try that so it was a very fortuitous set of circumstances that shifted my trajectory right as i was leaving college you know, and I have to say that it is, first of all, that's a remarkable story. And it, it's a, it's, it's really like, like I said, dream come true. And I'm, I was thinking about how much I liked LBJ and so forth. And even, um, what was, oh, uh, the good fight, but man, Joey, let me just blab here a second. Your honor with Brian Cranston single-handedly, probably some of the best television I've seen in the last 10 years. Yeah, it was really good. Peter Moffat uh, was our showrunner and creator of the show. And he, he, he blessed us all by coming over from England for a year to, to do what he did and told a great story. And then Brian is obviously a terrific actor and brought it to life. And yeah, it was good. It was really good. It was fun to watch. At the end of that show, you cannot fathom any other person than Brian Cranston to play that role. You know, a lot of times you can say, oh, I saw so-and-so the other day, Joey. Uh, yeah, a dog could have played that role or, you know, fill in the blank. But Cranston, please tell me that show is coming back. It is. It is. We are working on the second season right now, so it should start airing, I think, in December. Uh, but yeah, we, we were, I think we were about five or six episodes in when Brian Cranston was cast. And yeah, you have that moment where you think like, well, I hope this happens because now, now we're committed in our mind to this per person playing this role and it's going to be hard to picture anybody else. Um, who, who, Hollywood gossip, who was more fun? Who, who, no, let's not be unfair like that. What was it like working with Woody Harrelson? What was it like working around Brian Cranston? So I've actually, so now because of COVID, I, I've, interacted with Brian Cranston via Zoom a handful of times, but I've never actually met him. I wasn't on set for the, for the filming of that show, so the, I don't really have much of a comparison. Uh, but he looks like fun. 
He's got his own uh, tequila company. I'm sure he's a blast to hang out with. Uh, Woody Harrelson is exactly as fun as you might imagine he is, though. Yeah. Yeah. It was. He's fun on set, and he was fun. We played poker. We played backgammon. We played soccer. We, wow. <laughs> we did other things. Oh, yeah. He likes the herb, with. doesn't he? <laughs> he does. He does. <laughs> Now, here's the question uh, as I was preparing for this, and I, I'm trying to be really respectful of your time, um, uh, especially because you're wearing two hats. And I'm, I'm, I've only written one screenplay. Uh, well, actually, I've written two screenplays. One actually made it to a film, but I had to go make it myself. But the point I want to do is as I shift, how did, what made you shift gears from screenplay writing to crafting a novel? A couple things happened at once and they were all sort of, it was sort of fortunate, um, bad set of circumstances. The, uh, the pandemic hit, um, all, all, every, pretty much every writer in Hollywood had to fire their agent for somewhere between a few months and 18 months, depending on which agency you were at. And then I had, uh, I'd been up for a staffing job on the Lincoln lawyer series and I didn't get it, but I did read all the books in trying to get that job. And I fell in love with that series. And I'd had this idea kicking around in my head for this story about Marshall, Texas. So I found myself with a lot of time and one idea that I wanted to write. And I had just read a series of books and I thought that's what I would like to do with this story. So I had the opportunity to try. So this is literally a pandemic book. It is. Yeah, yeah. It, awesome. it is. It's perfectly paced. It's just the right length for my taste, uh, only because I'm reading so many books a week to do this yeah. show. But uh, it really is a spectacular. And I'm, I'm reading some of the blurbs on the back, if you'll bear with me a quick second. Let's take a short break. And when we come back, we'll hear what other people are saying about Joey Hartstone's latest legal thriller, The Local. Stay with us. Hi, this is Joey Hartstone. I'm the author of The Local, I'm hanging out with my new friend, David Temple, on The Thriller Zone. And I'm, I'm reading some of the blurbs on the back, if you'll bear with me a quick second. Sure. I mean, of course, to have Woody Harrelson at the top of the list is pretty good. A thriller, a whodunit, a sexy courtroom drama, and uh, takes place in his home state of Texas. Boy, he is a big Texas fan, isn't he? Yes. <laughs> uh, PJ Vernon, who's been on the show, who wrote Bathhouse, uh, you know, unraveling a fraught legal system page by gripping page. PJ's awesome. Have he you met so him? great. I have not met him, but I read his book. We have the same editor, so I wish I could have blurbed his, but his came out first. And <laughs> but yeah, he's fantastic. And that book is great too. Bathhouse is a great book. Terrific book. And he's such a masterful talent. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, uh, co creator of The Good Wife, The Good Fight, uh, and Evil, Michelle King says, a spectacular courtroom thriller. Now, and, and, and she says kind of what I wanted to say if you're a John Grisham, Scott Turow fan, Dude, I don't want to try to blow smoke up your skirt, but I think you're probably right up there with them. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, those are those are heroes for sure. Those are those are people that, that was the target uh, to try to get anywhere near what they can do, because I love those books and the movies that came from them. I, it does make me wonder. Uh, and, and if I were you, if I were sitting in your shoes and uh, standing in your shoes and I were uh, be able to write a, a hit novel like this and do screenplays like you're doing, write it on TV shows, I would probably say, yeah, look at in the rearview mirror toward law uh, holds no uh, real allure. So is it safe to assume, uh, to assume that yeah, I'm never going to pursue that in any way, shape or form? I will probably never go to law school, but I think I will always regret that I didn't. Um, I, even when the pandemic hit, I actually just just opened up the calendar to see when were applications due, and it, it, they had just gone. But I always say, if I knew I had three years where I wouldn't be writing, I would absolutely go to law school because I am jealous of everyone, anyone who has that education. Wow, yeah, that's and dude, that's kind of like uh, being a doctor. I mean, that is no joke. That's why I didn't do it. I knew it would be a lot of work. Uh, and I don't think I had it in me at, at any time in my 20s to do that. But uh, but yeah, I, it's a topic that I love. And I get to work with a lot of lawyers. And every time I have to pick their brains and ask them, which I had that knowledge in my own head, but I do not. Yeah. Here's an interesting thought. Mark Graney. Uh, are you familiar with Mark Graney? No. Okay. Mark Graney is a military thriller writer. He's on the show recently, a terrific talent. Everything he touches is turned to gold. He's got a new book out called Armored. Anyway, he wrote a series, the Gray Man series, and Ryan Gosling is starring as that. Yes. Yes. Okay. 
there you go. That's where you're up to speed. <laughs> and uh, just a monster talent. And he said very similarly to you, I think he started in 09. And, but right now he's got, I don't know, a dozen books here. He's written Tom Clancy, a half a dozen books there, audio books. He's just a rock star. But we were on the show recently talking about the difficulty of taking, and his manuscripts, Joey, are like, you know, 120 to 180, maybe 200, knocking on 200,000 words, uh, a little bit past uh, the local. Yours yeah. is probably, I'm clicking, I'm thinking 90 to, yep. 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 So we're talking about what's it like taking, you know, to go from say 120,000 to 120 page screenplay. And have you faced that challenge yet in your writing career? I have not. I actually adapted a book, but it's funny. I was thinking about this and that, that's sort of the, that's what the challenge used to be for a long time was you would take a novel that was far longer and denser in story and you would try and compact it into a two hour movie. But now because television is so ubiquitous, I actually, I, I look at the local and I hope it gets to be a television show one day, but it's going to be the opposite challenge. There's, there's not enough in here to sustain 10 episodes of television. So I'm going to have to figure out a way to infuse more story into it if I'm lucky enough to do that. Well, first of all, uh, good luck with that. I hope that happens. Uh, but also, uh, and, and you're right, th th this is truly, a, who did I hear? Someone famous used the phrase, it's the, the new golden age of Hollywood mm -hmm. because what it used to be, oh, everything was about making movies and then, it, and then even movie stars wouldn't appear in television. Then it became television when streaming took off and now movie stars can't wait to get into TV series. So it's a, it kind of makes sense. But here's the thing. Um, what do we hear all the time? A limited, limited release, right? Or a limited uh, yes. amount limited of series. Limited series. Thank you. Uh, much better at that than I. So instead of 10, you could release this as, you know, five to eight, I'm guessing, maybe five to yeah. seven. Yeah, that's all. I mean, it's always weird when you pitch a project like this because you could you might even pitch different episode numbers depending on which company you're talking to because some companies will do anything some companies it's standard eight or 10 or 12. Uh, so yeah it depends a little bit on where it lands but certainly they do five episode tv shows and and that that's probably five or six is probably what what is in this book right now so the rest is going to have to be invented by a writer's room if we go beyond that well, no one better to invent than you, Joey. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> and we're going to come back to that in just a second. We do a little feature on the show called Rapid Fire Questions. Super easy, super painless. But before we get to that, I do have to ask, and I want to ask you, especially in light of being not only my new hero, I, I hope I can say that without sounding, you know, superlatively like a geek, because the reason being you have your both feet planted in two different worlds that I often dream of being in. But what would you offer is based upon the 10 years that you've taken to get here and knowing what you know, and now I'm out with your very first debut legal thriller, what kind of advice would you give to my listeners and listeners everywhere that are thinking about, Ooh, I want to be like Joey, which may even end up being a t-shirt of mine. Um, what would you say to people who'd go, yeah, yeah I want to hear what Joey has to say. I, I still follow this advice, but I think to, to keep saying, you have to write because you want to write and 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 the 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 objective that you can control is completion and, and the quality as far as you gauge it but if you if you're hanging your happiness or even worse your unhappiness on the results uh, it's it's out of your control and, and and that's a good way to drive yourself crazy that is so superbly put um and i like a little piece of that back to mark rain again he said one of his pieces of advice would be finish it because what we often do is like, oh, let's get those first few chapters. And well, let me let me polish those a little bit. Let me polish a little more. And before you know it, you're you're six, 10 months in, you're still polishing your first 10. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I look at every piece of writing as an opportunity to get lucky. And the more you have, the more opportunities you've given yourself. So I, there, I think a lot, there's a lot of different pieces of advice and you have to take what works for you and what doesn't. But I don't, I've never heard anyone say the opposite of writing more is good. So I think that's pretty solid. <laughs> Speaking of which, you made me think of something. Uh, I got into a conversation with uh, Chris Hottie, uh, who wrote, uh, well, he's written a couple of books, Deep State and his latest is Storm Rising. And we were up at Thr Thriller Fest in New York last weekend. And we were talking about, uh, you know, uh, you know, being able to do the craft and so forth. And we said, you know, uh, and you've heard this before, 
you can't really be a great writer unless you're a great reader and great, great meaning kind of prolific. Would you agree with that? I would. Luckily, as a screenwriter, that means I get to watch a lot of movies and television and call that work. But uh, because that's my primary job. But yes, I agree. I, I, I consider it research. I, I wouldn't even attempt to write something if I didn't feel like I'd, I'd read enough and seen enough in that in that genre and of that field to do it. And help me break this down before we scoot. Help me break this down so I can understand your world even one step better. When you're watching TV show for homework, and it's completely legitimate, of course, because you you know, you instantly know, and isn't it funny, you instantly know what works and what doesn't work, right? Yeah. But how do you, A, do you, const, do you analyze it? Do you, do you first of all, just enjoy it at all? Or is it all business? Secondly, as you analyze it, do you see kind of cracks and fissures and so forth or, or places where you go, Ooh, this needs to be tied up or pulled. Yeah, I see all that, but I, I still enjoy it. I, I used to worry like once I understand how, how it's made, is that going to ruin it for me? But it doesn't. And in fact, if I enjoy it, even knowing how, it may, how it's made, that tells me how good it is. But, but yeah, I, I will often pause, especially just to see where we are in the show, how far into an hour long episode, did they do that twist or make that move? And then uh, my wife, Abby and I watch almost everything together and she's a writer too. So we pause a lot. And then we talk, what do we just see? What do we like? What do we not like? And why isn't it working for us? Oh, now that's fascinating. So you uh, let's let's break down one story real quick. So let's say it's a one hour or 90 minute show, one hour show, probably close to 44 to 60. And what should be ha where's that first line where you go, okay, if this hasn't happened yet, we're in trouble, what would that be? Um, you know, the, the first show that comes to mind that I really, really loved recently was mayor of East town, yeah. HBO, the Kate Winslet show. Yes. And, and, and what was amazing to me about that one is it ended the first episode where a lot would have begun. And so then our question was, how did they sustain 55 minutes of entertainment before getting to that point? And I think a lot of it was really good character development, incredibly, incredible actors. Um, but, but yeah, so when someone does something that's sort of unexpected and it works, then you really want to see like, how did how did they how do they go off course and still manage to pull it off? So you know, often you'll hear people talk about if you're not doing if you're not writing a story that shoots out of the especially with a thriller genre if you're not shooting out of the gate with some kind of a bam, then uh, you, you probably don't stand a chance. And actually, not to name drop, but to refer to Mark again because he made such a great point that it really stuck out into my head is he. Uh, taught a master class at Thriller Fest. And he was amazed at uh, the class was small, like 10 or 12. And people took that first entirely too long to get going when uh, the, the the advice became shoot, you know, just remove that. Uh, what's the word they call when you just exp exposition? Oh, thank you. Remove that shoot out of the gate and bring the exposition yeah. later. Yeah, I mean, there's it, it works so well, and but um, and that's why you see a lot of books start with a dead body right away, or a lot of shows open with that. Even and the, the big trick in television now is if you don't actually want to start your story there, you do a flash forward and you show where we're going to get in five or ten episodes, and then you flash back to the story you actually want to tell, and and it, and it works. It hooks you right away. I, I I had to think a lot about that when I wrote the local because I try. I actually, Mayor of Easttown was sort of a, a template for me because the dead body in in this book doesn't come until about chapter five, um, and and so that was a concern. Was you know. Am I going to entertain you enough with what patent law in Marshall, Texas is before I actually get to killing someone and, and get to the heart of the story? Um, so I had to try to find new ways to make it engaging until that point. Well, I love the fact that I learned something about patent law that I never knew. That's, you know, it's it's one of those tiny little things you go, oh, I walked away learning something. But here's another thing I did with a local, and I don't always do this, Joey. And part of it was because I'm so compressed for time. And part of it is I like, especially with a new author, I like to make full discovery. So I never read any of the, uh, what would be the blurb. I never, I never read that inside cover. I just went, okay, there's a guy in a truck in a courthouse. Let's see what he's got, right? That's all I knew. Yeah. So for me, it was a re it's particularly interesting trip because I'm going, oh, who is this? Oh, what is that happening? Oh, where did that come from? And a little bit I saw coming, but then when that inciting incident happened, which of course you would know on the flap, yep. I was like, wow. And then, then I'm all in. Yeah. 
Yeah. I, you know, like I said, it, it was a decision that I made, but what happened for me was I thought the reason I wanted to write this story was because I fell in love with what Marshall, Texas was and what patent law was in this little place I'd never heard of. And so I had to trust that what made me interested enough to research it for two years and then write it for a year might be interesting enough for a reader for a couple of chapters. And hopefully it is. Now, you're a classic example of write what you know, but what do you think about that phrase in general? Yeah, I, I think I think you I think honesty in your storytelling, it, it helps it feel authentic. So I think that you can do new things. So for instance, I've only been to Marshall, Texas a couple of times. I'm not that familiar with it, but I am from Flagstaff, Arizona, which is a small town. So anytime I felt like I'm having to cheat this or I don't really know how it was, I just wrote what Flagstaff would have done and what life in Flagstaff would have been like. And I knew, even though that may not be exactly how it is in Marshall, it's going to ring true because I'm talking about something that I actually know about. Yeah. Well put. I have to share this tiny little thing. I, I was moving from, I had a radio show in Chicago and it was the uh, end of dead of winter. I had had it. I was over Chicago, great city though. And I'm like, I'm packing up and I'm moving West. I'm going to LA. I'm just like you. I'm just going to, I'm going it and uh, whole hog. One of my stops was Flagstaff, Arizona. I remember driving for friggin' hours and I stop and I call, I think I called my mom at the time just to check in where I was. And I remember standing at a phone booth back when they had those on the top of a hill. And I'd love to impress you that I knew exactly where it was, but I had, it was in the center of Flagstaff or near a range. And I was just standing there talking. I'll never forget this. The air was, there was something magical about the air there. The sky was brilliant blue. A hawk flew overhead. And I'm just like, oh my God, I love Flagstaff. It and, is really beautiful. Yeah. Oh, stunning. Thanks for letting me go down memory lane. No, well, um, that sky is so clear. There's a, there's an observatory there and they discovered Pluto at that observatory, but it's a, it's a, it's like a, called a dark city or something, but it, the, the light is very dim. So you can see a lot of stars and, oh. Yeah, the night sky is spectacular. My wife and I pass through there. Every time we go out to see the kids in Colorado, we always stop in Flagstaff because we just love that city. Yeah. Well, once again, folks, this book is The Local. You got to read it. It's time for a little rapid fire questions. And uh, I promise it won't hurt. Okay, you have now, Joey, you've just gone back in time and you are defending, let's say, oh, I don't know, a man who's just murdered someone very close to you. I'm just going to pull that out of thin air. Oh, may, okay, maybe like your character in the James in the book. First, would you do that? Would you defend that guy, especially if that person that was killed was close to you? And secondly, do you think you'd be able to remain neutral, especially having that educational background you have? I'd say absolutely yes and absolutely no. Okay. Yeah. Yes, you would do it. And do you think you'd be neutral? No. Okay. <laughs> That's one of the things that was so intriguing about this book. He was, he's in, he's in such a moral dilemma. Well, I like to, I liked making him a patent lawyer because he's going to make a lot of mistakes as a criminal lawyer, but it makes sense because he's never done that before. Yeah. So he, but a very brave choice for him, but, and of course, a, by uh, reflection, a brave choice for you to make that juxtaposition and put him on the rivet. Well, I figured if I wrote anything that was incorrect about criminal law, it would, it would ring true for that character. So I wouldn't get dinged for it. <laughs> All right. As we mentioned earlier, the local has just been greenlit and made into a TV series. Yeah. Amazing. Just like your honor. Um, two part question again, cause I'm kind of famous for that. Number one, who would play James Euchre? And I am pronouncing the name correctly, right? You are. Yes, you are. Perfect. And number two, would you have any interest in helping with the screenplay? I'm going to go for trifecta and or be in the show yourself. I would absolutely love to write it. I would never want to be in it because I'm a terrible actor. <laughs> and I try very hard to not cast the main characters in anything I write, because like I said, you don't want to get married to the idea that only Ryan Gosling can play this role. And then you get someone else great. Then you get Matt Damon and you're thinking about it. I really had Gosling in my head. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I've specifically tried to not answer that question for myself. Okay. That's fair enough. That would be a good problem to have though, wouldn't it? it I take either of them. Yeah. They're fine. Yeah. <laughs> Ryan Gosling. I've followed him for years and, uh, yeah, he would, uh, he would do well. Okay. All right. Number three. The local becomes the next big thing 
and you've just been named the next John Grisham. Wow, did we just predict this? All right, what is the first and second thing that you have that you would do once you got the news? This is just a personal thing for you. I think first thing is I'd have a panic attack that I'm not halfway through my next book already. So without, <laughs> without question, that's where my mind would go. Uh, and then I try to celebrate for at least one night before I got back to uh, back to the computer. You're a real logical guy, aren't you? I am. Yeah. yeah. You're very uh, no nonsense, straight to the point. Not no fluff, right? I, I've hit a couple moments in my career where good things have happened, and I wasn't fully prepared, and and some opportunities passed me by. So I would like to not do that, but I'm also incredibly busy right now, which is why I'm not halfway through my next book. And will the next book a? It, it, it's I'm guessing it's not a sequel. It'd be another standalone, correct? I would like to do both, honestly. Oh. I, I have another character that I'd like to do, but I, I've also come up with a couple different uh, installments of this one. So I'd like to revisit Marshall, Texas. Uh huh. Just in case it gets greenlit. Right. You need multiple seasons of a TV show. Oh, dude. You are thinking. <laughs> All right. Last question. In keeping with this theme, and although it's one of my go to questions, it's perfectly suited for you. My double threat guest, you and your wife are invited to join me and my wife, Tammy, in San Diego for a celebration dinner. I mean, after all, you got to get out of uh, Studio City and just get. Yes. We got a quiet, lazy, cool little beach town called Encinitas so that you'd love. Yes. All right. We're going to ask you to do one. We've got all the dinner, all the cocktails. You only have to bring two things. And that happens to be two dream guests. They can be living or past. Who would they be and why? I think I, Bobby Kennedy's always been top of my list of somebody I would like to talk to. Um, and see, my logical brain is only thinking, where is my 14 month old? And did we get him a babysitter in time? <laughs> We're, we got all that covered, Joey. Okay, good, 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 good. Um, I, you know, I'd like to bring Woody Harrelson. I think you'd enjoy him a lot, and he'd enjoy you. So, thank I, you. I haven't seen him in a while. That'd be fun. Bobby Kennedy, Woody Harrelson, and the four of us. That, <laughs> that would be awesome, <laughs> man. Folks, uh, to learn more about the local, do me a favor and go check out joeyheartstone.com. You can also follow him on both Twitter and Instagram at JC Heartstone. If you enjoy legal thrillers as much as I do, you have to put this on your TBR list because for the love of Pete, uh, it helped discover a brand new up and coming author. Thank you so much. I appreciate <laughs> you having me. This has been a real treat. I mean, seriously, uh, I, I, I could probably easily geek out on uh, just screenplay writing alone, but yeah. I know that you're on a tight schedule and I, and I really, truly appreciate your being on the show, Joe. And I can't, I can't wish you any more success if I tried. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. It's been great being here. Thanks again, Joey. What a great story. What a huge success. And he's just getting started in the legal thriller world even though he's crushing it in screenplay writing. The book, once again, right here. The local Joey Hartstone. You're going to like it. Whew. All right. <clears throat> I think I mentioned earlier, perhaps at the beginning of the show, that June is a very special month. It is celebrating our one-year anniversary here at the end of the month. And uh, I am I'm excited. When I look back and I think to myself... I remember when I was first thinking about this podcast, now I had done one before uh, called Naked Monday, but when I thought about really being specific and coming up with a show that is right dead center in all of my interest, podcasting, my first love always because it's based in radio. Secondly, writing books, which as you know, I've written a couple. Third, screenplay writing. So that's why I'm mixing up this month with a combination of writers like this. And it's uh, pretty cool having our Discovery New Author series featuring Joey Hartstone. But let me tell you what is yet to come. Next week is going to be Tom Clancy and Zero Hour. <laughs> Tom Clancy meaning Don Bentley. Don Bentley right here. Don Bentley, we're going to work on getting your name up here. Don Bentley, super nice guy, also from Texas, and just couldn't be kinder. Speaking of Thriller Fest, as you know, uh, I spent, uh, what, last weekend there, just chock full of hanging around the biggest names in the industry. 
And folks, quick side uh, for my friends at Thriller Fest. If you've never done it, you got to do it at least once in your writing career. It is amazing. KJ Hal throws on a fantastic gig in New York City. And I spend a lot of time with this guy. All right, this is Steve Stratton. Now, this book right here, this was, I got this before it was, it's, it's ginormous. I got this before he got the, uh, the latest printing done. But uh, he and my good friends at the Force Poseidon uh, doing Shout a Tear. Uh, you'll remember Force Poseidon is, I think the very first time I got introduced to them was Eric Bishop, you know, the body man. Anyway, Shadow Tear, Steve Stratton, coming up still in the month. Now, as we approach that one-year anniversary, and in celebration of that one-year anniversary, which is which is more appropriate, one-year anniversary or birthday? Hmm. Well, we weren't given birth. Well, we birthed a podcast. You get my point. Guess who it is? Guess who? You've seen it. Bing Koontz. The Big Dark Sky, number one New York Times bestselling author. Am I a little bit intimidated? Maybe a little bit. Maybe, maybe I crush you. Oh, Dean Koontz on the show as we celebrate our one year anniversary and kick off season three. I am so excited. And in case you wonder why it's called season three, well, each year is broken into two seasons, six months and six months. So. One year anniversary, third season, Dean Koontz, The Big Dark Sky to celebrate. <sighs> I'd almost say stick a fork in me, I'm done, but I'm not. Because guess what? Coming up later this summer, this just came in the mail today. Just today. Heat 2. With my dear friend, Meg Gardner. Well, you know Michael Mann. Everybody knows Michael Mann. You saw Heat all time one of my all-time favorite movies ever she's coming to the show this summer sooner than you think thank you shane salerno at the story factory for sending a copy much appreciated talking about a stable of talent don't get me started but anyway that's coming once again though as we celebrate our one-year anniversary dean Koontz, steve stratton don bentley and then Joey Hartstone, which we just heard from, and Mark Graney kicked off uh, last week, and then Mark Langley kicked off the month. I love my life. I do, I do. I love this podcast. And I thank you. I want to say thank you so much for allowing me to come into your home, into your ears, into your office, into wherever you are, and share my passion with you. Books and podcasting. Doesn't get much better. Anyway. Thank you. Oh, and by the way, you want to do me a favor? Really mean a lot to me. You've heard me say it before. I don't want to beat a, an old horse, kick an old horse, kick a dead horse. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Would you write a review? Would you, you can spin up across to our website, thethrillerzone.com. You can leave a review there. Pretty easy. If you listen on Apple podcast, you can leave a review there. Five stars. Really awesome. You know, think about it. If you spend your time dedicated to something and somebody leaves you a one star, how bad do you have to be, right? Hmm. Anyway, Apple, Amazon Music, Google, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, wherever you listen, whether it's right here in California or anywhere across the country or around the world, I am looking at some of the analytics on this show and we are listened to all around the world. Wherever you're listening, would you do me a favor? Just drop us a note and say hello. It would mean the world to me. It's an email right here. Super easy. I'm going to put it right here. The Thriller Zone uh, at gmail.com. Easy, right? Drop us an email. Say hello. I might even throw a little, little something to you. Include your address and I'll, uh, I'll drop you a little something. A little parting gift. A little, little swag, as they say. Oh, speaking of swag, check it out. New ball caps. I'm, I'm testing some prototypes because I want to open up a store. And uh, for those folks who are big fans of the Thriller Zone, I've got them in black and white camo and red and black and uh, regular camo. It's coming, slow but sure. And the studio, we're, I would swing this camera around, but it is a friggin' mess. So what you see right now is neat and tidy, and it's a mess everywhere else. All right, I've rambled long enough. Thank you so much to my sponsors who have made this show possible. AuthorBytes.com, WritersBlockCoffee.com, now MeUndies.com, and DollarShaveClub.com. Anyway, thank you to my sponsors. Thank you for listening. Without you, I'd be 
talking to myself. I'm David Temple, your host. I'll see you next time for another edition of The Thriller Zone.